really is a great pleasure to be here. I, I've been in France for 37 years, and, and I remember back in the 80s, uh, for me, Grenoble was already you know, right at the forefront with people like Jeanne Hierro and Christian Jutin. They, they launched the Neuroscience and Sciences de l'Ingénieur um, meetings every two years. Great. This was before everybody started talking about you know, connectionism and all of that, and this was way before you know, the current vogue for deep learning that uh, has totally taken over. Um, so um, it's great pleasure to be here, uh, and, uh, and particularly in view of the fact that Toulouse and Grenoble are the two, two of the four sites in, uh, in France which have got this uh, uh, interdisciplinary uh, AI institute status. Uh, so I very much hope that, you know, especially we, as I've got lots of good friends in Grenoble, uh, 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 we will be able to work together on this and do things together. So thanks very much for the invitation. So today I'm going to be talking about... Um, uh, an idea which I, a uh, bit provocative, but it's the idea that what really is lacking from artificial systems is one thing that humans do really well, it's the ability to find repeating patterns. But before I get on to that, I want to talk, just give it a little bit of a, an overview of how I think biology can be a source of inspiration for uh, artificial intelligence. So I'm going to talk about a bit about fast visual processing, and Jean-Luc mentioned this, the fact that uh, uh, processing is so fast that we, it looks like there's a wave of spikes, uh, potentials going through the visual system. Um, and we can compare that now with the state of the art in um, com convolutional neural networks and deep learning. This is the, this is the, you know, the state of the art now in, in artificial intelligence, really. Because um, now, you know, in the last few years, we can definitely build artificial systems that can do things like object recognition as you know, better than humans, in fact. Um, but the problem with that is that the way that these, you, these systems are built really doesn't match how brains learn things. Um, essentially, it uh, involves training a system with literally hundreds of millions of training uh, cycles with uh, labelled data. It's easy enough to do if you're Google. Uh, you've got lots of labelled data because people send their photographs in and they, they, they say what they are and so on. But um, we, uh, they use a learning rule called back, back propagation of errors, which has been around since the 80s. Um, but we don't, the brains, I don't think, use this, this thing at all. What we do is learn very quickly to recognize things that repeat. Um, and my proposition here is that this is, this is actually a real key to understanding uh, why brains are so good at doing what they do. We pick up things when they repeat automatically. Without, without, we don't need reinforcement or labeled data. It, we just do this automatically. So, um, um, so let's let's uh, let's go in at first with about a little bit about fast visual processing. We've known since the 70s. Uh, Molly Potter at MIT demonstrated uh, what she called uh, RSVP, rapid sequential visual presentation, at 10 frames a second. I'm going to show you a, a string of pictures of animals, and at 10 frames a second. And basically, you know, your visual systems process these without any problem. I won't, you know, if you had to write down the 30 animals I've just shown you, you wouldn't be able to do it, but your visual system did the job. And if you throw in a, an odd man out in a string of animal pictures, as uh, I'm going to do here, it's very likely that all of you saw the Mona Lisa. Uh, let's try another one. You probably all saw Statue of Liberty. Uh, so the brain sort of picks up the odd man out. Did you see the, the Mickey Mouse there? Um, so the, uh, the brain is doing all this processing, and you don't really have to think about it. It just happens automatically. And, and in fact, I think you know, a, what, a lot of what visual processing is about is doing this. It's, uh, you know, we're flashing up images which you've stored somehow in your brain, and uh, it's activating visual memories effectively. So, uh, you know, an obvious question for a scientist is how does the brain do it? But it's also an interesting to say, can we build a, an artificial system that could do the same thing? So, um, uh, you know, we've been working on this, this for some years. So, uh, uh, Jean-Luc mentioned my, my biggest hit, which is this paper in Nature in 1996, where we took advantage of the fact you could now buy, you know, 60,000 images on CD, uh, CD ROMs, uh, and, and we just flashed them up for 20 milliseconds and got people to say, is there an animal in the picture, by letting go of a button. 
Um, so you had no idea what sort of animal to look for. But nevertheless, uh, well, firstly, reaction times are really quite short. You can, you can release a button in on around 400 milliseconds, but actually down to about 270. But the, the more important thing is that if we measure the activity of the brain with a, sticking electrodes on, 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 on your scalp, you get a... Um, um, this is the... Uh, the voltage, average voltage produced to distractors, non-animals, and to targets. And you can see that these two curves exactly superimpose until about 150, where they're, they're, there's a split. And this 150 millisecond differential activity tells us that the brain knows the answer, is there an animal in the scene at 150 milliseconds? Now, that came as quite as a shock to people in the computer vision field, I think, because people just sort of imagined that, that you know, there was a long process going on, you know, sort of rotating mo internal models to see if they... You don't have the time for this. This is a fixed processing time, 150 milliseconds. In fact, it's even faster than that. Um, <clears throat> Because we had another, we came up with another task, a, a saccade choice task, where we actually flash two images up, uh, one on the left, one on the right, as we do here, and we just ask the subjects to saccade to the side where there's a face. And we get saccades, if you were to imagine that I was recording your eye movements while you do this, uh, the saccades start at 100 milliseconds. So even before the 150 millisecond brain activity, the, uh, we're getting, you measure the reaction, this is the reaction times here. 100 milliseconds, your eye is moving to the side where there's a face. Um, now that, all that sort of, uh, it's a bit longer for animals, 120 milliseconds, but even a bit longer for vehicles. So you, you can sort of, measure, I mean, faces are the, 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 most, the thing that sort of pops out in the visual field most. We're super overtrained on faces. Um, but um, you know, actually, this goes back to something 30 years ago. I'd already sort of come to the conclusion that there had to be a really fast one-pass uh, mechanism. The reason for that is, this is um, when I was doing my thesis with Edmund Rolls back in Oxford, um, uh, uh, David Perrett was in the room next door, and he was recording neurons that respond to faces in the monkey infratemporal cortex, and they respond at 100 milliseconds. These are spikes coming out of a neuron in response to a face being flashed. And uh, you know, I just sort of, on the back of an envelope, sort of said, well, these neurons are about... Oh, can't see the... Oh, there it is. Uh, they're about 10 layers away from the photoreceptors in the retina. So you have to go through 10 layers in 100, in, 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 uh, 100 milliseconds. That gives you 10 milliseconds a layer. Now, we know that the firing rates of neurons in the brain rarely go over 100 spikes per second. That means that in that 10 milliseconds, you probably get one spike. So uh, I'd been taught that, you know, that the brain uses frequency coding. It's the rate of discharge, but you don't get more than one spike here. So the whole thing has to be done in a very uh, uh, simplified way. Um, essentially feed forward. Any loops would, would, would you run over time. Uh, and one spike per neuron, no rate coding and so on. So rate coding, which is actually what people even today believe is what neurons do, was not really possible. So I won't bore with you all the details, but I made a whole load of claims back in 1989 uh, um, uh, about the visual processing, even high-level visual processing, being done in a, in a feed-forward wave and so on, and, and using spikes. Anyway, so I won't, won't bore you with the details of that. But basically, to summarize, you know, we have this 150 millisecond response to, uh, to animals uh, in humans. We've got saccades. We've got um, face, faces, uh, saccades in 100 milliseconds. We've got these um, infratemporal cortex neurons firing at actually 80 to 100 milliseconds. And all of this suggests that there's this wave of activity going through the visual system here we are. So the image flashed up, and you just you just got one shot to get to do this. So uh, you know, feed forward processing, only a few milliseconds per processing stage, one spike per neuron, no rate coding, very sparse. All of these things, you know, really pointing to a particular type of processing, and also with no contextual help. You know, uh, the idea is that you know, even if you don't know you're looking for the Mona Lisa, your visual system will find it. No trouble at all. This is very different to what people thought was the way that vision was done. 
So if you say, can an artificial, system, artificial visual system do the same sort of thing? Well, let's just compare the brain with computer hardware. We know that the brain's got um, 16 billion neurons in the cortex. Uh, in that simulation there, there's actually 16 million of them flashing away and generating spikes. So there are 86 billion neurons in the whole brain, 16 billion in the cortex, probably sort of 4 billion in the visual system. Uh, the, the, the neurons have got a clock of sort of about a, a kilohertz because they can generate pulses, but not any faster than, uh, than that. Uh, 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 the real killer is the, uh, is the fact that the, the, these neurons uh, uh, only transmit at about one or two meters per second. This is incredibly slow compared with electronics. So you know, if you told Intel, build a chip where the wires uh, transmit at one, one or two meters per second, they would say, you know, no way. And yet it works. And it's very low power. It only uses 20 watts. Uh, now let's compare that with, you know, what you can buy now. You know, uh, buy yourself a nice uh, graphics board. It'll do 11 teraflops and uh, got thousands of cores, billions of transistors, lots of memory uh, uh, bandwidth. Gets quite hot, but these are, the prices are just dropping. And uh, and you can ask the question: Well, could you, if you if you knew how to program it, could you get it to do human level performance? By the way, if you if you if you really want some, you now go out and get the what is it, 130 tera operations per second. That's a millions of millions of operations. I mean, you can buy this stuff now. Now, um, you know, for most of my career, I sort of assumed that there was no way that we were going to be able to do this. You know, I mean, human vision is just too good. But there's a thing called the ImageNet Challenge, uh, which has been around for a long time now. They give you 10 million images uh, um, in, with 10,000 different classes. Um, you train up your system uh, for several weeks, uh, uh, and then you get tested on a set of new images which the system's not seen, and there are a 1,000 possible categories, and you, you, the winner is the person who gets the highest performance. Well, I was at the European Conference on Com Computer Vision in 12, uh, 2012 with Jan Lacan, actually. Uh, uh, it was uh, 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 the world changed this, 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 at this meeting because the state of the art in, in computer vision was just literally wiped out by a really dumb feed-forward convolutional neural network that had been trained with backpropagation. Uh, uh, so this was Jeff Hinton and his two students at the University of Toronto, and here's the architecture. It's just literally an image comes in, it goes through seven layers of, of neurons, effectively. Uh, there's uh, five convolutional layers and a, co a couple of fully connected layers, and then the output layer is just a thousand neuron-like things which are telling you which categories are present. And they give you all the, uh, all the details of the arc, how many neurons, uh, they give you the actual, these are the feature uh, that you find in the first, uh, first layer here. It's absolutely what I was claiming had to be the case, because, you know, it, you, you have to be able to do vision with a feed-forward thing. Um, so, you know, it's got lots of neurons, 60 million parameters to tune. So the real, the real trick... And uh, uh, Alex Krzyzewski is a super, you know, he's a, he's a GPU uh, freak who knows how to get the best out of it. He got this thing running in his bedroom sort of thing uh, for six weeks, training it up on, on this data. And the result was that, um, so Alex sent me, this is just a, a random selection of, of animal pictures, knowing that I like animals. And they're actually ranked in in um, how well the system performed. Uh, for each image, you've got the ground truth. This is what they're supposed to say. And these are the five most likely candidates. The length of the bar actually says how, how likely it is. So this is very confident this is a sea slug and this is a brown bear and everything. But the, the alternatives are, are all very sensible. These are all perfect. It's only this bottom line where things start getting a bit bad. Uh, bad. This is a spider monkey, but the system thought it was a howler monkey. That's a howler monkey. This is a spider monkey. You know, the images themselves, I, mean, I, I, I doubt whether any of you could tell which one's which. Uh, and and if you're making a few errors you know, here. This is my favorite. Oh, this isn't bad. Gordon Setter thought it was a chihuahua. You can't even see the head of the animal, and yet you know, it's doing pretty good. And this is my favorite. It got it wrong. It was a, the correct answer is cherry. It said Dalmatian. Uh, personally, I think that's a pretty good guess. When I saw this, I just thought, wow, I can retire. You know, um, uh, it's been done. We, we can, we've got a system. It, it, it runs, you know, uh, optimise this. It runs in a few milliseconds on, 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 on optimised hardware. 
But of course, you know, you know, people notice this. So Jeff Hinton and his two students set up a company called DNA, uh, DNN Research, and they were bought out by Google for hundreds of millions of dollars. And at about the same time, Jan Lacan, the other sort of pioneer French uh, guy who'd been pushing convolutional neural networks since the 80s, was hired by Facebook. And the world has changed, basically, uh, since then. This is ImageNet performance over the years, uh, only up to 2015, I'm afraid. Um, this here, this green dot here, is supervision in 2000 and, uh, 2012. Uh, this, in, this is human-level performance. So in, in 2013, there was a very courageous guy who spent months trying to train himself to do as well as the system on the 57 breeds of dogs and everything that you have to know. And he said, oh, yeah, I'm better than the, you know, these artificial systems. But you know, the year after, that was it. And, uh, and now, the state of the art is so good on this sort of thing that basically we're all out of jobs. This is another, <laughs> you know, if you try and earn your living classifying mammograms or something, uh, forget it. Um, you, you're going to be out of a job. Anyway, that's another, that's another issue. But um, so these, these, this uh, proves, I think, that feed forward convolutional neural networks are really very powerful. And effectively, you know, about 30 years ago, um, we were right when we said, you know, uh, it has to be possible. So the question is, has vision been solved? Well, the, for me, the problem is that um, all these deep learning systems, like supervision, are trained with this error back propagation rule, which definitely works. And the, and the, the architectures you get at the end are really very good. Uh, but it you know, literally requires billions of training cycles uh, with labeled data. And it's totally unbiological. I mean, even Jeff Hinton doesn't seriously think that this is how the brain does it. Humans learn in a few trials, uh, and with no supervision. Uh, um, and this is actually an idea that's in my ERC grant, which unfortunately just finished, I was saying, but um, we can recognize things that we haven't seen for decades, um, uh, or seen or heard, uh, and it appears that uh, this can be done uh, um, by simply exposure, a mere exposure to some old TV program, and, and you store the, you know, the, the theme tune and things like this in your head anyway. Um, I won't go into all, into all the details here, but um, one of the claims is that we can do this with a, we can create selective neurons with a simple learning rule, basically spike the time dependent plasticity. Um, and actually, here's another thing. We're claiming that we only need binary synapses, which are either on or off. The great advantage of that is it's much easier to store a synapse where you just have to say it's connected or it's not. If you want to keep something in your head for 50 years or more, then you don't want to have to store you know, 0.73 as a, as a weight connection. There's no way you can keep that going. Anyway, so let me try and convince you that this picking up um, rapid... Uh, repetition is, is something that we do very well. So we've got a little application um, called Brain Spotting that you can actually download if you've got an iPad. Uh, and we're using this to sort of test your ability to pick up repeating images in streams of images. So we, we, ha we actually use the ImageNet database. It's at 1.4 million images. And we just stream these through to the, to the people on your iPad uh, at various frame rates, that, which can go up to 60 hertz on, a, on an iPad. Uh, uh, we ha we ha all the images are new except there will be one image that gets repeated and your job is to try and spot the one that repeats. And the number of repetitions vary, the number of distractors between each repeat gets varied. This produces a huge number of different conditions, but the idea is we'll have, hopefully this will be so addictive, we'll have you know, hundreds of thousands of people doing this instead of Candy Crush or whatever, uh, and, and generating lots of data for us. So um, uh, this is what it looks like. So uh, here we've got uh, two images a second, and your job is to spot that drum repeated, and then you pick out out of a choice of four, uh, the, one, the one that repeated. So let's try another one. This, is, this will be a faster rate. There's a sort of bunch of grapes or something that got repeated. And so, you know, uh, this, this is the game. Um, uh, you might find it difficult the first time, but actually you don't need a lot of training. In that one, there was a dog that was being repeated. Uh, in this one... Uh, there's a ship got repeated. And I think there's one, one more. 
this little sort of thing that you saw sort of looks a bit more solid. It's quite interesting to see uh, what happens here. So um, we, you know, uh, we had a little competition in, a competition in the lab to see who could do this best. Uh, at this point, I was still sixth. With LED, you got 77.5%. Chances, 25%, right? So, I mean, that is incredibly good performance across all conditions. I'm now way down the list. All the young, young people do this better than me. Um, but this is, um, this is the effect of uh, bearing the frame rate, going from 2 up to 60 hertz. It's quite interesting. This is chance. And you're really good when it's only 2 a second. You, know, you can almost you know, name every image at that rate. But, but here, from about... 12, 20, 15 frames a second onwards, it's actually flat. It's really quite weird. And we've done this at 120 hertz, and it's still flat. We've, we haven't, we've yet to find the moment when the visual system can't, can't do this. So that's, that's interesting. Uh, the other thing is number of repeats. This is the number of repetitions here from 1 to 8. And you can see that your ability to do this goes up you know, fairly monotonically. It goes up particularly uh, in, the first, uh, in the first few. Now, interestingly, this one repeat, this is a trick trial, in fact. This is where, at the end of the sequence, you have four images. Three of them have never been seen at all. One of them was only shown once, and, and people are still doing 45% correct at picking out the one that was seen just once. That's pretty impressive. Um, We've uh, just published a, a, a proper study. We, we don't have enough brain-spotting iPad data yet, really, to publish it. But um, this, is a, this is an even harder task, because here um, we actually... It's, not one, it's what, not one trial at once. You get a string of images, a, thou, a thousand or so images, at a 15 frames a second or higher, it, within which... Here, here, there we go. Uh, within this sequence of a you know, thousand or more images, uh, there are 18 images that get repeated. Okay? And you have to try and remember them all. You actually have to press a button if you see a repeating image, so we can measure a reaction time there. And then at the end, you get 18 little uh, you know, four-choice things, and so you have to say, pick out the image that got repeated. All of the images have been, have been seen, you know, uh, but only the cat got repeated. And you also have to say how, how well do you think you did. And well, so um, essentially, we've you know the, the, you, this is the detection performance. This is the ability to press a button um, uh, to say I uh, you know I saw a repeating image here. But the, perhaps the more impressive thing is is this actually this is identification. So this is the ability to choose which of the four was repeated. And you can see, you know, we're getting the same thing. It's going up. I mean, you don't get up to 100%, but you're doing it still pretty good. Because this is, this is, you're being tested on things you haven't seen for actually a couple of minutes. And in fact, uh, remarkably, if you look at, you know, is there a tendency, if you leave a longer delay between the initial repeated stimuli and the test, does it make a difference? And the answer was, to our stupefaction, no. It, it was actually flat. In other words, uh, uh, we, we need to test the next day, but it's quite possible that this is, this, this, is, this is nothing to do with your ability to remember a list of things. Uh, it's your visual system is storing this stuff. So, um, that's pretty impressive. Um, um, we've done, done this uh, with audio stimuli as well, uh, and uh, hopefully the paper will come out before too long. So here we took my entire music collection and sampled 100 millisecond slices at random, and then we play those at different rates. Um, uh, and we get two, four, or six repeats. Uh, so I'll play you an example trial. So listen to this and see if you can spot anything repeating. <laughs> okay, now I'm going to give you two sounds, one of which was repeated and one of which wasn't. First one is this one. The second one was this one. Anybody like to say A or B? Uh -huh. Actually, it was A, but anyway. Uh, <laughs> it, it sounded a bit... Uh, the, the, uh, it, what didn't sound exactly like it should, I would say. But the, the, um, I can assure you that actually people do remarkably well on this. So it's a bit, bit detailed here. The, the clear critical thing, if you're using 50 millisecond slices, that's 20 a second, and they repeat... Oh, sorry. And they rep repeat... 
and they repeat. Um, Clack, 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 a bit. Um, you're getting 60% correct with just four or six repeats of this thing. And, uh, and you know, a, a lot of the time people think they're just guessing, but actually they're doing really well. So, I mean, you know, you, you don't necessarily feel very confident about this, but actually you do pretty well. Right. So, um, uh, this actually goes back to, how much time do I have? Not much, I guess. Five minutes. Ooh, right. Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna forget all this and um, uh, just say that this this actually goes back to um, uh, some ideas that we we've been working on for a long time. Um, spike time dependent plasticity is the idea that neurons, if they they fire a spike and they just receive some incoming spikes, you you strengthen those connections. And what um, Tim Maskelyi showed some time ago was that um, if you if you use this sort of rule you can find um, uh, this is Tim uh, uh, within meaningless data if, if there's this is spikes coming into a neuron it's all noise but there's we've artificially chosen a uh, a bunch of spikes these red spikes just randomly selected a bunch of them and said we're going to repeat that little motif and what we find is that one neuron with SDDP will pick that up on its own. And the reason is because every time the neuron fires, you increase the, 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 the connections from the, the, the inputs that have just been active. And that will make it more likely that they'll be find, found in the future. So in that learning rule, um, within a few, you know, 50 to 100 repetitions, you can get the neuron to become selective to that, that pattern of red dots. That's already pretty impressive, but it's not as good as we need to be able to match a human who can pick up on the, you know, on the second presentation. It, you've already noticed that there's this sound repeating. So um, I'm just going to go straight through to the, uh, this bit, which is you know, how, uh, what sort of learning rule could solve this? Well, we've come up with a new algorithm which we call JAST, and the reason why we call JAST is because of the four inventors, Jake, and me, Jake, my, uh, my postdoc, and Mia was a student, me and Tim Maskelyi. Um, and uh, essentially, this is, this is the sort of uh, hardware that we need to do this. We have input neurons coming in, we have output neurons, and we have actually just simply binary connections. Either, either you have a connection or you don't. And then we have spikes coming in like this. Here are some, a bunch of spikes coming into this system. And what these neurons are doing are essentially looking for um, coincidences, if you like. So um, in this particular pattern, you've got a, a bunch of spikes that are, are lined up. Where's my pointer? There it is. This bunch of things. And this, it happens that this actually corresponds to this neuron will like this. Okay, so that neuron will spot that, that particular coincidence. Now the trick is you want the, uh, the neurons to, move, to adjust their weight, actually moving the weights around to match the patterns coming in. So this is a really simple, um, simple architecture. And um, uh, maybe it's a bit too complicated to go into the details, but we've, we've, we've you know, tested this with thousands of inputs and thousands of output neurons. If it's just noise coming in, None of the output neurons are interested at all. But as soon as something starts to repeat, and we can arbitrarily define a, a, a repeating pattern, here we've just taken one spike as the sort of the start of a pattern, then taken one in every two spikes, and that makes a motif we're going to repeat. The first time you show that, it's the same as the background. But the second time you show it, we've got a couple of neurons here out of the output neurons. Say, oh, that's interesting. That's happened before. And within a few presentations, six presentations, we've got a whole pile of neurons are interested in this. If you just present noise to this system, nothing ever happens. And so you can tell the difference between noise and something which is um, not necessarily meaningful, because we don't know that these repeating things are of any interest, but you have to store them. I mean, the system can't avoid storing them. Um, so, uh, this is, you know, we, we had this running on a, an FPGA, a field programmable uh, uh, gate array, this little chip here. Whoops. Um, um, 
but uh, uh, the, the, the interesting thing is you could actually build uh, specialized hardware to do this trick. And, uh, sorry, that's the, that's the, this is where we did, there we go. That's uh, an FPGA, you buy those for $100. But with um, uh, Brainchip, which is a company, a Californian outfit that bought up the company that I set up with Ruth and Van Rulen and Arno DeLorme in 1999, SpikeNet Technology, uh, was mentioned earlier. They've, they've got a license to put this technology on chips, and they've got a custom chip called Akida, which is supposed to come out in the next few months. Uh, we'll, we'll see whether that's actually true. So the chip is, you know, it's got lots of, uh, it's got actually uh, uh, up to 1.2 million neurons on it and 10 billion synapses, uh, and it's got our on-chip just learning thing. And it, you know, it's, t 50, it's a little, you know, a seven millimeter um, ASIC chip uh, that, that could be produced for like ten to fifteen dollars. And if you fed auditory noise into it or images, it, uh, it's designed to pick up the things that repeat. And so um, the uh, the hope is that we'll be able to do what humans do spontaneously, finding the things that repeat on a chip that costs essentially nothing and could be built into all sorts of things. So, final thoughts. We're pushing the idea of bio-inspired AI, effectively, something which, you know, my colleagues in Grenoble have been pushing since the 80s, like I have. Um, and we've uh, I'll give them sort of th essentially three illustrations of that. One is feed-forward convolutional neural net networks, which, which we've known for 30 years, um, are capable of high-level vision tasks, and that's been confirmed by all the latest stuff on uh, on deep learning and the rest, all the rest of it. Um, I've also been pushing spiking neural networks. This is also something which is becoming more and more uh, interesting. You know, the more and more chip designers are talking about using spikes rather than sending ana you know analog values or floating point numbers around. A GPU, a GPUs can do the things that we're talking about, but they're incredibly inefficient in a sense because you know you need huge amounts of computing hardware to do you know literally trillions of floating point operations every second and so on. Um, so this allows for incredibly energy efficient processing. Uh, if you're just processing you know, spikes, this can be incredibly low power. And one of the things about Akida is that it's been very low power. And the final thing is this unsupervised learning of repeating patterns, which I believe is something that humans, and in fact all, all, all biological organisms effectively, that's what, uh, that's what we're, all, we're all interested in, finding things in the environment that repeat, storing them, and if they're interesting for behavior, then you use them, but you've stored them anyway. You don't, there is no rule that says, oh, it's repeating, but I'm not interested. Uh, that's why advertising is so effective. I mean, it's not because I hate this advert that I don't remember it, you know, um, if they repeat it enough. Uh, and so basically the, the idea is that you have, to, you have to learn everything. So you, you generate selectivity for the things that repeat. And then afterwards, it's a lot easier to, to, to um, uh, make a decision based on, on, on that rather than having to learn everything with backprop from scratch. So that's basically the end of the, the story. Um, I, uh, I don't know how much I've run, run by, but there, there's hopefully a little bit of time for uh, some questions. Thank you. I don't know if this, yeah, this works. Don't be shy. Otherwise, I'll have to put some of the slides I just chucked. <laughs> I have one, but I, I leave for the audience if somebody. So let me try with the first one. Um, how do you conceive the, the, the question of, of hierarchy in your, in your system? Because, of course, it's one of the, yeah, of the so strengths of the deep learning. So the, the chip I showed only has one layer. You have spikes coming in, and it looks for patterns. Uh, in the incoming century data. But you can take the output spikes of that thing and then just put them back in, in the input. And so now you've got a system which can develop a second layer of neurons and then a third layer of neurons. And so if you've got a million neurons, as Akida um, allows you to do, it, uh, it would be nice if you could have them connected any way you want. Actually, unfortunately, the current Akida one won't do that. It's for feed forward. 
but my uh, hope is that uh, the, the next generation will allow recurrent things, in which, which case you can build up the entire system from, from the, the input up. And in the auditory system, the first layer would look for the you know, little coincidences in the auditory nerve, and then you'd look for coincidences and patterns that repeat in the next layer and so on. And by the end you finish, you, you're understanding speech, hopefully. Um, uh, and in fact, you don't, it's not just sensory data that you can put in this sort of system. I mean, you know, motor control you could do in the same way. So you've got internal patterns which are going ongoing, and you can link those to robots and things like this. I, I, you know, I think that, that general principle of just you know, using lots of neurons, lots of potential connections of which actually only a few are used, and a learning rule that allows it to, to you know, pick up the things that are repeating could go a long way, I think. So yeah, no real limits on the architectures. Uh, thank you for your talk first. Um, you say you like animals, and my question is um, how emotion affects uh, your result? Um, the way to so, um, to get the learning repeating patterns, I don't think you need to, have, to be particularly, uh, uh, I mean, none of these, these patterns that are, are, are being re um, repeating sounds and things like this requ require emotion. But of course, emotion. Uh, emotional reactions are very critical for deciding what you do with things. So a, a stimulus that repeats and is associated with electric shock or with food reward will be immediately be connect, come connected into, into behaviour. So just picking up repetition doesn't tell you what to do with it. Um, the emotional impact of something will tell you whether this, you want to eat it or whether it's dangerous and you have to run away from it. So, um, uh, so in addition to this um, unsupervised re uh, pattern repetition thing. We also, in fact, that's what we're currently working on. We have reinforcement-based learning on top of that so that things that get reinforced or produce negative consequences get wired into behavior. So uh, yeah, uh, emotion is important uh, for sure. Um, but we don't really have that explicitly done uh, yet. Thank you very much. That was fantastic. <clears throat> I have a question about uh, the uh, bioinspiration and uh, in physics and nature there is laziness or minimization of energy. So I'm wondering in just, you know, when do you stop uh, learning for uh, learning from the inputs? You, you don't actually. Uh, so what happens is that if you if you repeat five times some random bit of noise and you produce a neuron that's become selective, that neuron is sort of safe because actually the probability that it will fire to a random input, you can calculate that it's extremely low. It's going to, it will fire by chance to random input, you know, like once in 100 years. However, if ever it's activated again, it will, it will be, it's still learning. So if, you know, if you, see my, if you rec learn my face today, and the next time you see me, I've shaved my beard, my beard off, then you will update your representation uh, at that point. So we know that when you reactivate memories, they are actually label, labile, sorry, and uh, uh, they can be modified. So you never need to turn the learning off, but because, and this is one of the claims in my ERC proposal, is that the secret of having memories that can last like for 50 years, an old TV program from the 60s you've never seen and you recognize, you know, wow, yeah, I've. Uh, um, that's because the neurons that were, which stored that have just been sat, sitting around for 50 years doing nothing, just waiting for, uh, for the, that old TV program to come back on again. Very, very low power, right? So you've got, you got, you got your 16 billion neurons, uh, and the claim is that 99.9% you know, .9 of them never fire because uh, they've learned things that you've, you've not experienced recently. That, now that, that, that's how you get down to 20 watts. If all those neurons were firing away at one spike per second, which is what most people believe, you've actually you've used up your energy budget and you're wasting your time. Okay. Is that a question? Yeah, thank you for your talk. I was just thinking about the links between biochemistry and these neural networks. Uh, mainly, you know, uh, about dopamine. We are learning uh, easier, the most salient stimulus. Yeah. So uh, actually, the less predictive one, 
Yep. Uh, so higher the dopamine is, um, less predictable is the stimulus. So uh, how do you consider this in these models? Okay, so I, I think what I would, I would argue for is that there, the cortex does the, 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 the repetition learning thing automatically. Uh, incidentally, we have inhibition between the neurons. So once you've learned, you've got one neuron that responds to something, it will inhibit other neurons and prevent them all learning the same thing. So that's, uh, I didn't mention that, but that's actually vital. But the, 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 the role of dopamine is, you know, is this surprising? Uh, is it important? That's, uh, for me, it's not in the cortex. It's in how you wire it up through the basal ganglia and things like this and deciding what to do. So... Um, you know, is this particular uh, thing that's happening significant? Well, uh, if it's if it's uh, if it's new, if it's not it's not predicted by what what was happening beyond, uh, uh, beyond uh, just before, then that it automatically makes it uh, interesting. And so you can have, in addition, circuits that will sort of pick out the things which are uh, which go against you know your predictions, maybe. Um, and that could involve, you know, brain, brain stem areas and dopamine and noradrenaline and so on. Um, but I quite like the idea that we have the cortical mechanism for learning repetition is, is just there and it's, it's operating all the time. Thank you, Simon. I think we have to stop here. So let's thank the speaker again.